Memories are precious, aren't they? Keeps us going. And these memories, even at unpleasant times and moments, help us to remember. Gives us a reason. I, I think about this brick. There's so much memory. It shapes us. It reminds us. And this brick, there's an identical brick uh, in Colorado. This brick is so memorable. At times, people put engravings in it. And for us, especially as maybe some of you, many of you have walked into our Hayashi home and you find us in our front door. It's, it's uh, Kennedy and myself, our wedding day. Uh, and this, the same engraving of this brick is on the steps of the place that we got married in Colorado. And I love it because it helps us to remember of those good times, help us to remember why we do what we do. Today, we'll be looking at the passage in Luke 22, where Jesus says, as the title of the message, in remembrance of me, where Jesus observes the Last Supper, where Jesus took the bread and the wine. He says, do this in remembrance of me. He was participating in something that was a very ancient art. As you see here in the slide, Jesus took this old symbol and he put some new meaning into it. You can follow along in the bulletin and jot down notes. I want you to remember this as, as we go off. And this is the unleavened bread. The feast of Passover, the unleavened bread that we see. The master teacher takes this. They've been practiced for decades, centuries, years and years. And Jesus highlights the significance puts a new meaning to that. A new meaning where Christ himself is going to participate and point to the future of his sacrifice, his death, his cross, his resurrection. It's so significant for us to remember in what Christ has done. Perhaps some of you have joined a church recently. Some of you may have heard this as a memorial supper, which points to his body that was broken for us, his blood that was shed for us. Some of us are maybe familiar with this as a word of communion, which highlights the believer's intimacy we have at Christ. Christ's sacrifice and atoning work, whatever we call it and whatever we, we, we put that label, the ordinance, the sacrament, this is clear. It says, do this in remembrance of me. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to the gospel accounts. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 7 and verse 38. Okay, if you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 7 through verse 38. You know, I remember uh, as I was going through Bible college, there was a pastor who said, you know, there's nothing like the sound of the turning of pages. You know, it's just a glorious sound. Today, instead of that, I get to see the warm light that warms up their faces through the glow of their smartphones. All right. If you're there, you can say amen. amen. This is the word of the Lord. There came the day of unleavened bread, the which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare a Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have it prepared? He said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you and follow him into the house that he enters. And tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room? And I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it. And just as he had told them, they prepared a Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup. And when he, got, he had given thanks, he said, Take this to divide among yourself. For I tell you that from now, and I will not drink of the fruit of the vine 
until the kingdom of God has come. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, and after he eat, and saying, The cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes and is been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. A dispute arose among them that which of them was going to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentile exercise lordship over them and those in authority over them called and benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let him, the greatest among you, become the youngest, and the leader, one who serves. For who is the greater, the one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You, or those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones in judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to you to have, uh, to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both in prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crawl this day until you deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, When I sent you with no money bag and knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has the money bag take it, and likewise knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. But what is written about me has its fulfillment. May God bless the hearing in the reading and the understanding of his word this morning. Let me give you a quick historical background and context here. For those, as, as we're entering into the text of the New Testament here in New, Luke 22, for those who are unfamiliar, this is, like I mentioned, a very old symbol. It was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Historical background, establishment, this was in doing remembrance of Exodus 12. Anybody know that story, what's going on? Yes, it's a story of Pharaoh with the Egyptians taking over the Israelite, the promised people, and they were harsh, and then Moses escaped and brought Aaron standing before him and said, let my people go. And they didn't listen, right? Pharaoh says, not today, no. And then the plagues start coming. We call this the 10 plagues. One, two, three, four, all the way to the 10. And the 10th 10th plague was the plague that really kind of turned things around. You see, the angel of death came along and came and was going to take out every firstborn. But God said he would protect his people. How did they know? Well, they got the blood of the lamb. Around their doorposts, they put the blood that they were covered. So the angel of death would come and not swift them out, right? But Pharaoh didn't listen. And then his firstborn child was taken as well. You see, this deliverance of the story of the Israelites, it was, it was a promise so much more. Ever since then, they said, we are not going to forget what God did then. So we're going to do this in remembrance of him. Now you see, fast forward, Jesus comes along, 
This is during the Passover, the unleavened bread. And Jesus comes and he looks through these, this, this Passover lamb and, and they didn't fully understand what was going to take place. They didn't fully understand until the crucifixion and the resurrection took place. But Jesus, the feast, remembers these new symbols. Jesus is saying, remember that by my death and by my substitutionary atoning work, you're going to be set free. You see, that Passover lamb served the purpose, a greater purpose, that, that Jesus himself, I'm, I'm kind of giving the answer uh, beforehand, but he became the substitutionary atonement for all mankind. So those who would believe and repent in Jesus as the Lamb of God, the one who would take all the ways, all the sins of mankind, then they will be set free. So like I said, the Passover lamb served to substitute the firstborn of Israel. Jesus became the substitution atonement on Calvary. Having set the stage, let's dive into the first point. What do we see here? The first thing is that his body and his blood was in my place. Let me say it this way. Christ's body, his flesh, and Christ's blood was in not my place, your place. It was in our place. Verse 7. He dives in. He talks about that Jesus had prepared a way. And, and, and Jesus has uh, summoned the disciples for the upper room. And it was all orchestrated sovereignly. God knew it all. And everything was worked out. God, God, Jesus, the God incarnate, Jesus Christ, he, 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 summoned, he summoned them and he began to take and participate in this beautiful ceremony called the Passover meal. You know, Lord willing, next year, uh, we're, we're hoping to maybe bring a Messianic Jew and they're going to lead us through an actual Passover meal. Wouldn't that be cool? Amen. That'd be awesome. I'll just get Linda Hattachel. She's going to lead us through that. And she's looking, nope, nope, pastor, you're not doing that, <laughs> right? And, you know, I, I really want it, to, it's an incredible ceremony as we begin to see each element. We're going to kind of briefly walk through that today. And, 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 and also the Good Friday service, by the way, who's excited about the Good Friday service? What? Who's going to be there? Nobody. Oh, okay, great. Yes, awesome. You know, somebody was asking, pastor, why are you doing a Good Friday service? I was like, well, you see... Or church, our flock's been waiting seven, eight months for a really good preaching. So I just thought I would just bring the best preachers in town. It's fulfilled. Some people got it. Sorry. Um, so let me just walk through the order of the meal as, it, uh, as if somebody was walking through a Passover meal, right? So there's four kind of order in the Passover meal. The first thing was a preliminary event, which there was a blessing over the first cup. They would take the first cup and they would bless that in the wine, and, and there was a dish of herb that they would participate and get into. The second element that as they went, walked through was they began to recite the Passover liturgy, which this was called the Great Halle. Remember we talked about this last week? From Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, as they began to recite and remember some of the elements and in, in the things that they together celebrate and worship. And then after that, they would participate in getting into the meal, the Passover meal. They would have a blessing a pronounced over the unleavened bread and the bitter herb. And during that time, they would take the third cup of the wine and they would drink after the meal. Last but not least, they would remind each other through the great Halle, through, through that portion as they sung together, uh, as, as the fourth cup and to that point, as they would drink and celebrate together. So if, you're, if you haven't grown up in a Christian setting, uh, this is pretty crucial, the communion. As I, as I said, the ordinance or the sacrament, some people call it differently. But let me just walk through as we dive into verse 19 here, as we see in the following slide. What do you see here in verse 19? What does it say? And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's pretty important, right? As we, as we see in verse, 20, uh, verse 19, Jesus is emphasizing that this is my body. Can you imagine as the old disciples, they probably were shocked. They've never seen or heard a, a rabbi or anybody said like, Jesus, are we talking about cannibalism? Are we like literally eating your body? I'm like, I was like, no, no, no. It's important, the emphasis, do this in remembrance 
of me. It's not the word is, by the way. Some people think literally somehow the bread that we're eating or the wine, there's something magical happens. It's the literal blood of Jesus, literal body of Jesus in the flesh. It's not that. The emphasis is remembrance rather than is, okay? Does it make sense? Y'all tracking with me? All right. So, 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 so when, when that do this in remembrance of me, you're thinking like, oh, I think I heard that. Yes. Every time when we have Lord's Supper and the communion, which we're going to participate later, uh, that comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, which talks about Paul. Yes, Paul himself, the apostle Paul, wrote about this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Yes, that's where it's quoting. That's where the scripture comes. It's really pointing to Deuteronomy 16, verse 3, during the Exodus uh, period, the church were to celebrate the Lord's Supper in remembrance of God's eternal covenant that he came to fulfill in Christ, in Jesus, as a Passover meal reminded the children of Israel in the departure of Egypt into the promise uh, that, that God's new covenant, his death, that, that we remember what he, he has done, but also his return. That they're looking, longing to come, Lord Jesus, even so quickly. They're doing this in celebration of his work and his death, but also the return, you see. Let's go along. Let's follow verse 20. What does it say? And likewise, Jesus took the cup after he had given Eden, saying, This is my cup, this that poured out for you in a new covenant in my blood. You see in Exodus chapter 28, verse 24 verse 8, ratified the covenant that, that Moses himself, yes, Moses, the man, the law, the prophet, the one who brought from Sinai, Exodus 20, the law of the covenant. This, this was a covenant fulfillment. The blood, the shedding of the blood, that, 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 that sh the shedding of the blood symbolized that we would be set free. That because of the shedding of the blood, because of atonement that took place, because of the shedding of the fulfillment in him, that we will be saved. We will be saved, you see. So at this time, I'm going to invite a theologian scholar uh, up on stage. So would you give a big warm welcome to Kaide Hayashi. Come on up. Woo! Woo! So, um, you know, we've been going through some study, and then we've been understanding how can one be saved. So I'm going to just ask her, because she is a brilliant theologian scholar, scholar okay? So Kaide... How can we be saved? Only by faith in Jesus Christ, atoning this on the cross. Let's give a hand for Kaide! <laughs> so she said, it's only by faith in Jesus Christ in his substitutionary atoning death on the cross. You may be thinking, like, where did she learn that? <laughs> well, let's learn together. Check out this video. Let's say it together in the New City Catechism, question 29, how can we be saved? to show in this next slide, I recommend those parents or grandparents, if you want to disciple your children, there's a great app. It's called the New City Catechism. It's free. You can download it on your smartphone. So I do this every single day with my daughters uh, and my son uh, in the first thing in the morning. So there's, a, there's actually about like 52, 53 questions on major doctrines of the truth. So, you know, maybe the next slide, it looks like this on the slide, as you see, 
uh, as we follow along. Oh, nope. Yep, there you go. So there's like three parts that talks about, you know, God as a creator, faith and the lo love, and then talks about Christ, which Richie, really is the doctrine of Christology. And then it talks about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, part three. Uh, and so right there it says, what is our only hope in life and death? And then, you know, it has a long, like, a prayer that you can pray together. There's a scripture verse that goes along. There's a commentator that goes along. And there's some music that goes along with it. So I really want to kind of recommend for you to study the major doctrines of God's truth. It's super, super good. Uh, you know, we just went through it this morning as well as, as, we, as we've been studying together. But that's crucial, isn't it, as we think about you. You may be thinking like, oh, what does that have to do with the Passover meal? Well, it has to do everything with it, by the way. Because when you think about you know, theologians call this penal substitutionary atonement. So substitute. Uh, anybody know what the word substitute is? Anybody? Huh? I'm sorry? Take a, uh, take a place of. Like a substitute teacher, right? Do we have any substitute teachers in the house? Come on now. We got none. Wow. Okay. Well, well the idea of a substitute teacher is that if somebody, you know, the primary teacher is not there, the substitute teacher get a call and then will fulfill whatever the primary teacher is not there, right? Does it make sense? So when we talk about a substitutionary atonement, you were like, I don't know that word. What's well, not in the Bible, by the way? Well, that can't be true. Did you know Trinity is not in the Bible? But you know the Trinity is true, right? Amen. 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 Come on now. <laughs> All right. So like atonement is really the idea of you're atoning for something. Paying something in place of that. So when Jesus, when we say he was a substitutionary atonement, Jesus became the substitute of the judgment, the wrath that needed to be filled. Jesus took place in place of us. Amen. So when we talk about the Passover meal, the Passover lamb, you know, people deserve that judgment. But you know what? There needed to be a shedding of the blood. The lamb. Amen. You know what Jesus did? Jesus is truly God. He's divine in nature, but also he is in his deity and his divinity. He is human and God. And so he is eternal. He's immutable. He's never changing. He's everlasting. So we no longer have to have a substitute of a temporary fulfillment anymore. Amen. When Jesus died on the cross, it was finished. Amen. Like it says right here. Amen. Not like it will be finished, or I hope it will be finished. He really meant it on the cross. We're going to cover that next week, by the way. So when Jesus came as a substitutionary atonement, Jesus came to fulfill the death. Jesus gave hope when there was no hope so that salvation could be secure. And we could be confident in the sole confidence of Christ's atoning death of the cross. That's the reason the Lord's Supper is such a big deal, by the way. Let's continue on. i got five minutes, and i got to do two more points. Lord, have mercy. Um, oh, let me talk about the elements in, in the Lord's Supper real quick. So one of the few things that are super important is that there is five elements in the Lord's Supper. So, so uh, one, one of the first things is the Passover lamb. So they would serve a lamb, which kind of was pointing that, the shedding of the blood of the Passover over the doorsteps in order that we can escape the visitation of the death angel. Second element is the unleavened bread. Reminded it the swiftness that they didn't have much time to bake a bread. So the unleavened bread pointed uh, that, that as they would broke, break that bread. The third was the bowl of salt, of water, reminded them of of their captivity, of their tears and their groaning as they were in that exilic period. The fourth element was the bowl uh, of the bitter herb, which reminded the bitterness of the slavery, a captivity that they were in. Fi uh, last but not least was the four cups. There were four cups in each of the order that you went through. What are the four cups? As you see here, uh, as we walk along with it, 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 the first one is that God said, I will bring you out. I will bring you out of that captivity. Second was, I will get rid of all the bondage that people have. The third was that I will redeem you. I will redeem you. And fourth, which says, I will take care of my people. 
Yeah, you can follow along, Corbett, on the slide right there. So there's four things right there in which the promise right there was saying that I will fulfill, I would promise. I, and all that been fulfilled in Jesus, right? I mean, look at it. Just real quick, the Passover lamb. Jesus was the lamb of God. Take away the sins of the world. Jesus came to shedding of the blood. And even when death comes, we are secure in Jesus. Hallelujah. The second is that the unleavened bread. Jesus is the bread of life. So whoever comes to him shall never hunger nor thirst. And, and talking about the bowl of salt, the, 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 the tears. And when Jesus says, I thirst, and he cried out from the cross, that, that, that bitterness and those tears and captivity. Jesus came to bind the broken heart and set the captives free. Now, the fourth that talks about the bitter herb, Jesus went through the bitterness and he came and saved even on the treacherous cross, even the bitterness that he endured that Jesus did. And the fourth cup, he delivered all that. Wow, is that incredible? As we see here in the slide, the element used in the Lord's Supper, the body and the blood of Jesus, is a powerful symbol that Jesus suffered and died in the real historical time and place. And, and it's true. It's a true, it's a true event that Jesus took. And that's something that we celebrate this day and for eternity for all the days to come. Let's, let's follow along. The second thing we see here is the greatness. The greatest is to be the lowliest of all. The greatest to be the lowliest of all. Verse 24. You know, actually, right before that verse, verse 23, what does it say? You know, Jesus gives the table and the cup, and then he says right there, verse 22, for the Son of Man goes, and it's been determined, but woe to the man. Who's he talking about? Judas Iscariot, right? He's going to be betrayed by him. It's to be betrayed. And they began to question to one another. So, and then, you know, they began to question, and you know the next scene in verse 24 there is a dispute. What are they disputing about? Which are they going to be the greatest? Can you believe it? I mean, Jesus, I mean, he came to seek and save the lost. He's about to participate in the Garden of Eden. He's going to sweat blood, even to the point, and he's going to go to the cross. He's going to stand before Pilate. And then, as we see here in the slide, I mean, like, these knuckleheads are fighting about who's going to be the greatest. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Jesus is like, he knows his end is coming, but they seem like they can't get their act together. These disciples, you know, they're, they're talking about who's going to be the greatest, who's going to be on the right hand of Jesus, like on the, in the table, you know? And, you know, we don't see here in Luke 22, but in another account in the gospel of John, John chapter 13, where they're arguing, and you won't believe what Jesus did. You know what Jesus did? He got on his knees. He got a bowl of water. He got a towel. He began to wrap it around himself. He began to wash the feet of disciples. What? The master teacher coming on his knees, washing the feet of the disciples? It was, it was incredible. And Jesus begins to wash the feet of the disciples. And it's, it's beautiful. Anybody seen a feet, foot washing service? Anybody? Good, good. Where, where, where have you seen it? Oh, okay. Good, good, good. Did I see your wedding? Oh, oh, Awanas. Who said wedding? Women's ministry. Good, good, good. You saw it at a wedding? Good, good, good. So I've seen it at a wedding recently. And, you know, it's, you know, it's like, it's beautiful, right? It's kind of like, you know, the pastor is all elegant, dressed up, and beautiful, you know, Bach music playing in the background, the classical music. The girl's hair is going through with the beautiful breeze, and the, the beautiful white dress stainless going through like that. And then the man has a bow tie and good-looking, dapper Dan Asian, right, like looking fine and dandy. Well, that's totally contrary to this, this story, Right? I mean, that's not the case. It's probably a crowded room, very small room. You know, back in the days, they didn't have beautiful concrete rolls or cement or anything. It was dirt, and they wore sandals. Perhaps they were walking around, and they even stepped on cow poop. And it was so normal, by the way. Every meal they had to do, what, you know what would happen? They would have a slave or servant 
And the servant would come and begin to wash the feet of the disciples or wash the feet of the guests. Well, Jesus instead gets on his knees and begins to do that. But just remember, this happened every single day. It's as simple as almost mundane, so ordinary, it's like somebody taking out the trash out in the garbage. It's so mundane, everyday thing. It's almost like wiping somebody's bottom and cleaning out the poopy diaper and throwing in the trash. It's a simple, mundane, everyday thing to the point that you come to a toilet and you're wiping somebody's button. That's my everyday life, by the way, as a dad. <laughs> Can we just be honest and transparent? Like today when we talk about servant leadership, we think it's climbing up the ladder and being recognized and being applauded. Jesus totally countercultures that. He says, anybody who wants to be great among you, he says, get on your knees. Do the dirty job that nobody wants to do. Not a beautiful picture, not a beautiful music with photographers taking pictures, cameraman coming along. It's so simple, so, so every day. That alone is shocking. But what I was reading, that blew my mind. That Jesus does it for every single disciple. Is that incredible? That's including Judas Iscariot. The man who's about to betray him and sell him. Going to be murdered on the cross. And you know what? Jesus says, the one I'm going to give this cup or this bread is the one who's going to betray them. You know what's funny? Is I never noticed that until here in verse 23. The disciples had no idea who Jesus was going to. Which tells me that Jesus treated every single person the same. You know, if I have a hard time with somebody, you know what I do? I give them the silent treatment, right? <laughs> like, or like, I try to avoid them. I'm like, okay, okay, there you go. God bless you, right? <laughs> but, but when Jesus said that disciples had no idea who they were talking about, I'm like, who could it be? Who could it be? Which tells me in John 13 later in the context, he says, you would know that you're my disciples by what? By your love for one another. And Jesus says in John 13, as we see here in the slide, Jesus turns around, and you know what he says? You ought to wash one another's feet. He, wasn't, he was doing something so simple. He says, you ought to love one another like this. If you want to be the greatest, this is how you be the greatest. You treat those who hate you with love. Those who cuss you out and gossip and stab you in the back, Love on them. What? As we see here, true servant leadership, fellowship with Christ is actually found in submission. Submission as a servanthood to one another. Wow. Third point, we see this. We see the betrayal from a best friend. We see a betrayer, a betrayal from a best friend. You know, I really think Jesus had some close relationship, and one of them was Simon Peter. Verse 31, it says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. Da, 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 da. Peter says in response in verse 33, Lord, I am ready to go with you both in prison and into death. It's amazing, isn't it? And then what does Jesus say? Before the rooster crows, you're not going to just deny me once, not just two times, but Three times. Wow. You know, just, just so you know, when we're reading John 13, you know who's the one who says, Lord, you can't wash my feet? Who is that? Peter. Peter, as we you know, follow along with the slide, Peter was the one who said just prior, Lord, you can't wash my feet. You know, and then Jesus says, I must do this. You know what Peter says? It's interesting to me. I never caught this until I was studying the text. He says, well, wash my head to my toe, right? Put me in a bath. And I was wondering as a high school kid, I'm like, that's interesting. Why would, why would Peter say that? It's interesting. And the, as I began to study the text, as I began to see this, it made clear to me as we think about the Lord's Supper. For those who are in Christ and those who are with him, united in Christ and Christ in us, those we have been immersed in baptism, we walk with him in communion with him. It's crystal clear that 
The blood of Jesus has cleansed us from head to toe. We don't need just a part of it. We need our whole being to be cleansed and clothed in righteousness. I think that's the point as we see here from our perspective. We have been eternally cleansed from head to toe already through the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Oh, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but blood. Oh, what can make me whole again? Oh, what a fount I know that Jesus, the, what can make me whole again? It's nothing but blood, blood of Jesus. Amen. And that's what we're doing, by the way. We're participating and we're looking. And we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, eternally cleansed. Jesus poured a personal Savior who forever washed our sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We celebrate the victory. Yes, that's the Lord's Supper, by the way. Amen. What are you trying to say, Pastor? What I'm trying to say is this. The Lord's Supper is a picture of the gospel. It is a picture of the gospel, isn't it? It's a powerful message. Perfect time and people opportunity to receive salvation by grace through faith and by believing and repenting. If you don't know Jesus, place your faith in him. Turn away from your sin. Believe Jesus who died, buried, rose again. And he's coming back. He is coming back. We do this in remembrance of him. As we see here in the slide, the Lord suffers a visual presentation which causes us to look back to the cross. Doesn't it? So when we do this, we're not just going through the motion and doing it. We're looking to the cross of Jesus. We're looking to him. We're also looking to his return. It's a powerful picture. So why do we do this as we see here? Lord, the Lord's Supper, your personal salvation in Christ. But it's not just personal, is it? It's a communal thing. We do this as a family. There's a community of believers elected for eternal life, worshiping together to love, to know, to look. What are we doing? We're doing a little examination inwardly, but also outwardly. We see here in verse 27, verse 28. It says, for who is greater da, 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 in, the, in the table of who serves? See, do you see the Lord's Supper there as well? We are to, to reflect our lives a bit and say, if there's any sinful way, search me, O God, and know my heart. If there's any wicked ways, lead me in the way everlasting. When we do the Lord's Supper, we got to do some serious investigation in our lives. And say, Lord, forgive me. If I've sinned against a brother, I'm going to leave my, leave my gift at the altar and be reconciled to one another. Because this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Well, not only that, it, 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 outwardly, it's proclamation through the Spirit of God, the supper, the Lord's death unto his return. So there's an inward but outward. You know, one of the things I love coming back home after a long day of work and you know what I love? It's, you know, my children would come around and say, Papa, Papa, and they, they get around. But, you know, you know, I love my family, but, you know, I realize my home and family is not just a building, right? But there's something about I come home, my wife made a wonderful meal, and I get to sit around the table. And Kaida's sitting right here on us, right here and my, my beautiful, wonderful wife next to me, and then said, you're sitting right here. And I get to sigh, like, ah, I'm home. I'm with my family. Which we get to really share a life together. Our memories are made around the table as we eat together. We talk about what God's doing in our lives. We have a, a little reflection. What, what are some good things that God did in your life? What are some sad things that happen? And we pray for one another. That's what it means, the Lord's Supper, by the way. It's a little time that we get together as a family. And we're home. And we remember that we, we're in this together. And we get to remember. I, probably the church is no more than a church. The bride of Christ is no more. But when we're around the table... And we would never forget 
what Jesus has done. It reminds us who Jesus is. May we never forget who we are in Christ.